the second part of the video, 11 through 20 here. So picking up with number 11, this question threw me because it just seemed a little too simple. Uh, but when you're looking at this, we're looking at a, a, a YouTube with mercury in it. So the mercury is this kind of shaded substance here. Uh, this is how they used to do gas measurements back, back before they had sensors and things like that to make it a little easier. Uh, and we have a pressure of a gas trapped in here that is 615 millimeters of mercury. This ends open to the atmosphere. So the way you want to attack these, if you're not familiar with them, is you want to look at which side is pushing more. In this case, the atmosphere is pushing more than the pressure of the trapped gas. And it's pushing more by the mercury from this height to this height. Okay, so, so basically this side is pushing with a certain pressure that's equal to the pressure here plus the pressure from the weight of that mercury. Okay, so these kind of two total up. So we have this pressure of 615 millimeters of mercury plus the, the pressure from the weight of that 65 millimeters equals the pressure of the atmosphere. So in that case, we have 615 plus the 65 is 680 millimeters of mercury, and therefore C is your correct answer. I mean, really, honestly, you're going to be doing some kind of subtraction or addition of this amount, and you just got to kind of do a which side is winning, this side's winning, by 65, at 65. So pretty simple question to start at 11. Uh, on to number 12, what's the reading of the burette? This one's not really challenging, but maybe in a, in a time limited environment, maybe this one throws you. So, so we're looking at the bottom of the meniscus, of course. Uh, so what I would do with this is I would actually just label. So we're looking at 30 here, and here's 31. Therefore, this is 30.1, 30.2, 30.3, oops, 0.3, and 30.4. So the other thing that can throw people sometimes is when it's on a line. So let's pretend it's not on a line. Let's pretend it's just a little bit below. So it's between 30.3 and 30.4. Therefore, it's 30.31, you know, right? Well, now it's actually on the line at 30.30, and that's C. And so that's how we would do our measurement for that. Okay, uh, here we're boiling aminopentane, one aminopentane. It's on a hot plate brought to a boil as it's boiling. Okay, so as it's boiling, we expect the temperature to remain constant, assuming it's pure. Uh, and it implies that it's kind of open to the atmosphere. So total energy of the system stays constant. Uh, problem with that is we haven't defined what the system is. So does that mean the amino pentane? Uh, so that's not very clear, but we're putting energy into the system from the hot plate. So unless that system is defined as the hot plate and the electricity system, I, I don't buy that as being a possible answer, so I, I don't like this answer, okay? Uh, the hydrogen bonding between the amino pentane molecules is disrupted. So one amino pentane has an amino group on the end, and then it's got kind of all the carbons attached over here. So we are going to have hydrogen bonding between molecules because the negative charge on that nitrogen and the positive charge on the hydrogens on separate molecules will attract each other. So this is a potentially good answer. Ion dipole forces between the one amino pentane molecules are disrupted. So if it's pure, then that's not going to be the case because we're probably not going to have many ions. Uh, that would involve an acid-base reaction where an H plus transfers from one to the other. Uh, but that would produce a, a negative charge on nitrogen. It's not very stable. So this, this doesn't look like a very good answer to me. Uh, with a better answer there, I'm ready to kind of get rid of that. Uh, pentane and ammonia gas are formed. We're not looking at a chemical decomposition. We're just looking at a boiling. So therefore we go back and we pick B as our best choice. Okay, and if you've never seen this demonstration, um, you just take a long tube. There we go. And we put ammonia on one end and hydrochloric acid on the other. And the gases from those are going to then mix down the tube. And when they meet, they form an ammonium chloride. So the molar mass of ammonia is about 17 grams per mole. The molar mass of hydrochloric acid is uh, 30, 35, 36.45, yep. So 36.46, I guess, technically. Getting a few unnecessary significant figures there. So these are more massive, which means that at the same temperature, therefore, they're going to be moving slower. So we have this kind of distribution where these are generally speaking moving faster, these are moving slower, they're going to meet and form ammonium chloride somewhere, and it's going to be closer to the hydrochloric acid end because of that 
uh, because of how temperature is kind of defined, right? That the, at, at the same temperature, these are moving slower than these ones. Now, there will be some of these that are moving quite fast, but some of these have been moving even faster, some of these have been moving slow, but many of those have been moving slower. So we expect the band to kind of form over here. Okay. So closer to the end where the hydrogen chloride is inserted, B would be our choice for that. Okay, this question uh, I ended up getting wrong the first time I took the test, so I got trapped on this. It's at the boiling point of negative one degrees, so we have this container, and then we compress it. So here's our liquid, it's boiling, we produce a bunch of vapor. It's at an atmospheric pressure, okay? So boiling is where the kind of vapor pressure and the external pressure are equivalent. So then it says we decrease the volume to 0.7 liters and it becomes smaller. When we do that, what's going to happen is more of this vapor is going to turn into a liquid. So we're, we're kind of increasing the rate at which this kind of turns back into this, and then that's going to form a new equilibrium. But when it does form the new equilibrium, the pressure will still be the same because it's at its boiling point. So B was the correct choice for that. So you can't just do a simple Boyle's Law for that because of the fact that the liquid is present at its boiling point. Instead, you're going to see the potential for some of the vapor to turn more into liquid. Okay, this one also is a little tricky. So we're looking at a nonpolar substance and a polar substance, and it's saying what's the principal energetic factor? Okay, so there's two factors at play on why these two do not dissolve well in each other, so hexane and water. Uh, one is, is that the water molecules uh, have a proclivity, or proclivity to stick together well because of their hydrogen, hydrogen bonding capabilities. The second one is, is an entropic factor. So since they said energetic, we're going to focus on the, on the intermolecular forces between the water. So the two choices that probably a lot of people go between are the strength of the intermolecular forces between the hexanes and the strength of the intermolecular forces between the water. Because the water are stronger, they're able to form a, a they're able to have a bigger uh, effect on this uh, dissolution uh, than the strength of the hexane ones. And so therefore, B is our better answer compared to A. Okay, for 17, uh, they're comparing silicon dioxide, SiO2. So since it's silicon, we're on the look for a network covalent compound. And it's silicon uh, by itself, uh, the melting point is a little higher for this one than this one. What's the best explanation for this? Okay. So if we go down the answer choices, the oxygen silicon bonds are stronger, that would make sense. If we have stronger bonding in a network covalent, that's going to be harder to disrupt that covalent bond, and therefore this would be a stronger substance that's harder to melt. Um, silicon dioxide is an ionic solid, while this is a metallic. So this is a metalloid, so maybe that's a possibility, or there's some kind of metallic interaction here, but, but that I'm a little torn on, but silicon dioxide is not an ionic solid, that's a network covalent. Uh, so B is incorrect. Silicon dioxide is polar, so polar in this context really doesn't make sense because the solid interactions are held together by covalent bonds, not by intermolecular forces. Silicon is nonpolar. If this were just a nonpolar substance being held together by dispersion forces, it's not melting at 1400 degrees Celsius. So that answer also is no good. Uh, and then this one, tetragonal or crystals, while well, silicon forms cubic crystals, that would have to imply that there's some kind of spacing issue in the crystal structure causing them to be slightly apart. Now on the one hand, that is a, a good response to the fact that these are close. However, I don't know what this is, I don't know what this is, and I don't trust that difference without any more explanation about the, the uh, proximity without another good answer. With another good answer on the board, I don't, I don't like D as much as I like it. I go for it. Now if this had been a bad answer, maybe I could come back and rationalize that as being, I need to eliminate these three and then go to that. But with a good answer, we're gonna go with A. All right, and then we're looking at a cubic structure in the next one. So we're looking at zinc sulfide. So one of the things we need to find on this, there needs to be the same number of zincs as sulfides. So we need a one-to-one -one ratio because that's our actual formula. So if we're looking here, the large spheres are zinc. So there's a zinc here, 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 and here. And those are all embedded within the structure. So they're all within the cube. And so therefore, there are four zincs. Therefore, there should be four sulfurs. But let's kind of go through. So here's the sulfur at each corner of the cube. And at each corner of the cube, 
those are all two plus and two minuses, by the way. So each corner is shared by eight other unit cells. So this one, you can't count this eight different times, it's only one, one ion. So what I need to do is count one eighth of it towards this uh, crystal, and then, or cube, and then one eighth towards each of the other cubes. So that is one sulfide. And then I have one, two, three, four, six, six at a face. So the face is shared between two of these uh, unit crystals, and so therefore I have to share, this is, this is half to here, half to over here. This one's half to here and half to in front. Half to here, half to this one. Half to here, half to one above. And so I have six times one half, that's three more sulfurs. So in total I have my four, so I have a four of zinc and four of sulfur. Okay, and here we're looking at a simple enthalpy of formation calculation, uh, nothing crazy here. So we need to do products minus the reactants. So we're gonna have two SO2s, so two times negative 296.4. Okay, and let's put a big bracket around all of our products. And we've got two liquid waters, and that's negative 285.8. There's all of my products. I'm gonna subtract from that all of my reactants. I have three oxygens, that's zero. And then two H2Ss, which is negative 20.15. Okay, so I'm just gonna do the sum of those two. And that ends up coming out to be, sorry, uh, D, which is negative 1,124.1 kilojoules per mole. Okay. Units are a match, so we don't have to worry about any conversions there. Otherwise, pretty straightforward calculation. Of course, oxygen being the element. That's the reason why that was zero, as per our definition. All right, and then here we're looking at Gibbs free energy. So, so this one's probably a little tricky for people. So just so you know, there's a difference between delta G of a reaction and delta G not of a reaction. So this is at standard conditions, and kind of the philosophical difference here is this is under standard conditions how thermodynamically favorable something is. This is under whatever the specific conditions are now. And there's a relationship between the two. Uh, and that's one that you want to be familiar with this level of chemistry test. And that is that the Gibbs free energy for a reaction is equal to whatever the standard is minus RT natural log Q. Okay, so, so Q here, whatever your concentrations and amounts of chemicals are will influence what the specific mixture is and what your temperature is will also influence what the specific mixture is. If those are at standard conditions, then this would come up the equivalent to this uh, and your delta G would be at zero, okay? So does delta G depend upon temperature? Of course, if you heat or, or cool something that's going to affect whether or not it will occur spontaneously. Think of like melting. At some temperatures, melting is spontaneous and at others, it's not spontaneous, okay? Uh, and then concentration of species, that also will affect your Q, it'll affect your equilibrium, and therefore it also is affecting your energy. It's going to affect your Gibbs free energy. So both of these matter, and therefore C would be our correct answer for number 20.